Ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm going to do the introduction of Professor Epstein in absentia. Um, and I sort of knew, knew that that might be the case because um, uh, uh, Rich, Richard is, um, is, was teaching a law school class that was over at noon. And he told me that he would be five or 10 minutes late getting over here. Um, but he, he, will, he will be here. But I, so my introduction, some of you have gotten the brochure. Um, and, and if, did some of you get this? No, we, we, we had some, we'll send back a few more copies here. Pass, pass, take one and pass. Um, but, but in the brochure, I, I actually referred to, uh, to, to, to Richard being my, um, uh, my colleague in developing this series all the way back in 1981, uh, which, which is 30, 31 years ago. Um, we, we, did, we did the first series here at the university called Bad Outcomes After Medical Innovation, um, out of which we published um, a book uh, with support from the National Science Foundation. Um, and, and it was actually the success of that first seminar series in 81-82 that led us year in and year out since then um, to do a health-related seminar series that, that cuts across um, a topic area of, of interest both in the medical side and also at the university side. Um, and uh, as you know, in, in, in recent years, some of our topics have been global health. And last year, we did healthcare disparities. And this year, we're doing medical professionalism. And in fact, next year, um, we're doing ethical issues in organ transplantation. Um, and I think it, later today, this brochure is going to go to the printer. Our, our, our first version of the brochure for next year will be sent off uh, to the printer, because we, we have lined up 24, 25 seminars featuring most of the um, leading spokespersons in the country on organ transplantation um, for next year. Uh, but ju just a quick word about Richard. Uh, many of you have heard Professor Epstein before. Uh, he's, um, he's something of widely regarded as a polymath um, who currently is dividing his time between um, uh, NYU Law School, where he is, um, where he is the Lawrence Tisch Professor of Law, uh, the University of Chicago, where for many years uh, he had been the James Parker Hall Distinguished Service Professor, and, and now is is the uh, James Parker Hall Distinguished Service Professor Emeritus, and and finally at the Hoover Institute um, at Stanford. Uh, where he's the Peter and Kirsten Bedford Senior Fellow. To, to sort of establish his polymath credentials, what I will tell you, uh, what I, I will read to you, um, are the courses that he's taught at our law school. Um, Richard has taught courses in. Now, mind you, on most of these things, he's written books, too. So it's not just teaching courses. But he's taught courses in civil procedure, constitutional law, contracts, corporations, criminal law, health law and policy, legal history, labor law, property, real estate development, finance, jurisprudence, labor law, land use planning, patents, individual estate and corporate taxation, Roman law, torts, and workers' compensation. As I say, for many of these topics, he not only teaches the courses, but in fact uh, writes the books. So uh, that's Professor Epstein. Uh, he should be along any minute. So, so eat a little bit more. And um, uh, Richard is going to speak today on deprofessionalization of medicine, the relationship between medical protocols and clinical judgment. What I'm going to do is to try and put this topic in what I would call a slightly broader context. 
and to talk about the general way in which the uh, ability to access information can influence the distribution of powers inside various sorts of organizations, which I think is really one of the fundamental challenges of, of modern industrial organization. And the reason I'm doing this is because I think that when people do medicine from the inside rather from the outside, uh, the dominant trope that they have is about how special they are given all of the particular issues and concerns that they have, uh, the special relationships with patients and so forth. And, and the basic answer to that question I think is as follows. Every business is special. They all have particular kinds of concerns. And that what you need to do is to have a theory which can work two ways simultaneously. One is that you have to be able to start from a level of high generalization and see the common features having to do with the diffusion and organization of power. And then the second is to figure out what it is about the particular cases which answers this particular question, is how much discretion unavoidably has to be exercised in trying to put together a comprehensive organization and at what levels will it start to be exercised. One of the reasons why I'm interested in this as a general problem is that uh, my own legal profession is undergoing much the same kinds of prevail uh, that is taking place within the medical profession. And I thought it might be instructive before I talk about the particulars of the medicine side is to show you that I'm a bipartisan skeptic and I'm going to talk a little bit about how it is that one sorts of organizes, for example, uh, the practice of law. And one of the things, oh, you want to do this while I concentrate. What you want, yeah, I've got the napkin. What you have to understand about it is that the legal convulsions are every bit as great as they are in the medical business because the old line sort of large law firm, we handle all your cases, we do all your stuff model is essentially disintegrated. And the reason why the model starts to disintegrate is that when you use models of fixed proportions, models where you have, for example, partners, call them senior doctors, residents, or associates, what you do in order to make this model work is to have to be confident that over the very large run of cases, each of the components to this particular system are receiving an income, an amount less than they're contributing to the overall success with respect to the firm. As the nature and the types of information that become available start to change, it turns out that the assumptions that allowed you to keep these large firms together become almost untenable and they start to break up into smaller groups, all of which are organized on very different lines. And I think you'll see the parallels to the medical sessions I just talk about it a bit. So in the olden days, if you had a large firm like White and Case, you were the firm of choice with respect to U.S. Steel. But as you get better information and higher degrees of specialization, what happens is the people who start to buy legal services start to look at the particular firms and they say, you know, you really have done an excellent job for us as an antitrust lawyer, but frankly you're kind of thin on the sort of environmental issues that we have to do. And what you then start to do is to run a competitive boutique out there and start to ask whether or not if we take this part of the work away from one firm and give it to another firm, whether or not we're going to have better overall legal services than we would have had before. Well, when the new guys start to come in, they're going to realize that everybody's going to be very price sensitive about the way in which this thing works, and they will have to ask themselves the question, do they want to staff up the way the old firm did, or could they find a way in which they could change the internal operation of their own organization so as to be able to deliver a pound buck? So that competition in these various kinds of end markets essentially puts a great deal of pressure on unremunerative and unproductive services within the side of the firm. And so what then happens? Uh, you get firms saying, where can we cut? And at the same time that you get that, what you find out is that there are all sorts of ways now in which you could harbor and collect information that were not available inside the profession some time ago. So that one of the skills that used to be very important how you could track down statutes and laws that affected your particular case. So you used to go to the library and send people there and they had these big bulky bottoms called shepherds and what you did is you go through it and then you go online just to make sure that nothing happened in the last two weeks or a month that would do this and you spend a lot of attorney time, fairly delicate, very skilled to do so. Once you start getting these online type of services that are available, uh, you can digitize every document almost instantaneously anywhere throughout the legal system so that the search function, which used to take very sophisticated lawyers to do it, all of a sudden becomes much more routine. Or to put it in the terms of the um, sort of organizational experts, of which I don't claim to be one, 
uh, it becomes not a skill which has a market profit associated with distinct activities, it becomes commoditized. Well, that means, in effect, it's sufficiently standardized that you do not have to pay people to acquire special skills to do something that anybody who can push a button can start to do. So what does this start to do? Well, it means that you change the nature of the firm because these kinds of associates that you have turn out to be highly redundant and not effective. One of the things you do, therefore, is you go into what they call contract attorneys. So that if it means that you've got a case in which there are kind of very exhaustive searches that you have to do which don't require a great deal of intelligence and sophistication, instead of paying in-house people and having to keep them on the payroll for the whole year out, what you do is you subcontract out um, to people and all of a sudden the wage structure that you're paying is not going to be $250 to $300 an hour for somebody with this min newly minted law degree. It's going to be $50 to $75 an hour because as the level of discretion goes, it turns out that the salary that's going to accompany it is going to disappear and go down as well. It also turns out that when you're dealing with large firms, another major piece of change which leads you to the contract attorney less important, I think, in medicine, but critically important in law, is that you find that your business doesn't come across the transom at uniform rates. Uh, what happens is you get crises, huge cases, periods of relative calm. And what happens is if you have yourself a large law firm, you're going to have a lot of redundancies in that firm because in the slack period you're paying people who are basically throwing uh, darts into boards instead of people who are working flat out. So if you go back to this kind of contract system and think of a perhaps slightly more sophisticated attorney, what happens is you, you hire up for the crisis on short-term type of arrangements, and then during the slack period, you get rid of people so that the risk is now going to be transferred away from the firm which gets the primary business. So at this particular point, what it does is it looks like uh, you can commoditize and contract out all sorts of routine business, but what is so different, well, this is a point which is important in law to some extent in medicine, on the structural side of medicine but not in case treatment, is that at the same time that the, basically the bottom end of the business looks more like bank tellers and less like lawyers, the top end of the business becomes more remunerative than it has ever been before. And this has to do with the relationship of discretion to the modern administrative state. Um, most of you have not thought the slightest bit about how administrative authority is derived from general legislation. But suffice it to say that virtually every standard grant of power that is given to a major organization, including those that directly regulate medical care, has something in there which says that fair and equitable regulations in the service of the public interest shall be required of everybody. Now this is meant to be a constraint and it certainly does rule out certain things. It means that you can't, if you're a key administrator, allocate 98% of the money that you receive to the treatment of your mother-in-law. In other words, you can't practice medicine under these statutes the way in which the worthy Dr. Sigler does with respect to his friends, take immensely good care of them. Um, can't do it. And you can't make obvious kinds of discrimination based on race or national origin or the color of people's eyes, all sorts of things. That's all true. Nobody wants to do that for very much anyhow. So that what you're left with are hundreds and thousands of decisions which do not have these kind of obvious flags and markers associated with them, calling about great improprietary. And what the administrative state has been forced to do, willy-nilly, is to say, if we've got this level of ambition and the kinds of things that we want to do, when we're running comprehensive cleanup programs for the environment, right, when we're running complicated labor codes, when we're trying to figure out all sorts of issues associated with trading stocks and securities, financial instruments, what is a systematically high risk, is you necessarily create high degrees of discretion over a very few absolutely critical decisions. Do you make a list? Now sometimes you really want to be on that list because that's a list which makes you a preferred provider which means that when somebody wants to prescribe in some complicated medical system all they have to do is to fill out the name of the pre-approved drug. Sometimes it basically puts you on a hit list. You are now a very large company and you are treated as a financially systematic and significant institution and so the folks under the Dodd-Frank Act can regulate you to your eyeballs precisely because you're not at 50 billion dollars, you're at 51 billion dollars and that difference will be near in one regulatory scheme after another. So the guys who make all the money in the system are the handlers, for good and for bad, 
who essentially move people back and forth across these various regulatory divides. This is a highly discretionary business. It turns out that you have to have enormous knowledge at virtually standard economics, standard public choice theory, deep knowledge and understanding of the way in which a particular industry has worked, this historical evolution. You must know a great deal about the people who are on the commission. You have to be able to evaluate complicated reports, all of which are going to be wrong in some way, but nobody's quite <laughs> sure which way it is. So that the way in which professional life is organized today is that you get the high discretion, people with enormous incomes, and anything that could be commoditized on the other side of the market is in fact going to be relegated downward to much lower wages, if you can run it this way. Now this is exactly the kind of challenge that is going to be faced by health care. Um, when I was here for November, I was on the panel after two doyens of the uh, American medical establishment of impeccable credentials and perfect cartel-like instincts, I might add. Um, they were Dr. Arthur Rubenstein and Dr. Chris Castle, right? Both of whom were Chicago style. And, and these are folks who have an enormous knowledge for the way in which the distribution of power ought to take place inside medical agencies. So when it comes to the question of how it is that you structure the provision of care inside the system, they both came up independently and correctly, they thought, with the proposal that it's only medical expertise that can drive the proper division in the way in which a health care system is going to be organized, which meant that they as deans and solons of this particular system would in fact take the dominant plan. Now I take a very different view. One of the things that I've done for many years is to teach in Mark's program uh, to the basically the sum of people coming in on the special medical ethics program to discover to my infinite dismay that if you start talking about the phrase marginal cost of public good, you have to give a little definitional account as to the way in which these various terms are put together and to operate. And so my own view about the system is that the medical people will eventually have to do one of two things. They will have to either educate themselves in principles of management and business organization and economics, or they'll have to get the hell out of the operation because they won't know enough to be able to save themselves. That doesn't mean that they won't be consulted, but they don't have enough design knowledge. Now this has already happened, by the way, in law firms. So for example, you want to run a law firm. You look around and say, you know, this is a $2 billion a year business. Do we want to take a guy who doesn't know the slightest thing about an organization chart, um, how to run anything, um, and put him in charge? You say no. So one of two things either happens. If you think that the legal knowledge becomes so indispensable to being able to run the firm, you take one of your promising young things, say, your job is now get an MBA for the next two years, and we'll pay you your $2 million in salary so that you get this kind of education. And then you're going to run this firm because you will now have at least the kinds of skills so that you can figure out who to hire, even if you can't do it yourself, as your CFO, as your chief compliance officer, a lot of other things. And the same thing clearly is starting to happen on side, the medical side. People have to get themselves dual degree equipments if they're going to be able to do this. To give you an illustration of an early entrepreneur who was my student, who saw this so clearly back in 1973, uh, the redoubtable David Kessler was a man who came to this law school precisely because he knew that if he wanted a career in medical administration, and he was running for FDA commissioner as a freshman law student, you could tell. Uh, it was, yes, yes, Lanny, he really was. And he was proud of it. I mean, it's not as though there was anything dark and mysterious about it. He figured out, long before other people figured out, that the dual education was well worth the extra three years in terms of your ability to straddle a field which is going to require heavy inputs on both sides. And it turned out he was even more right than he thought because when it came to running medical schools, the imposition of various kinds of federal controls with respect to the operation of the system, right? They also required the kinds of skills that he had acquired in law school. And if you then realize that, if you figure this out in 1985 instead of 1973, is the way David figured it out, um, you are going to be in there and the number of people capable of taking senior positions is going to be very thin because there are very few people who have done the kind of thing that you've done. Afterwards, you do it. So just being able to anticipate the way the market did gave this guy huge economic rents relative to all of his competitors, all richly deserved, 
Because what he did is he figured out something which most people who were working in your profession did not do. Mark and I met on an airplane in that year, and I think neither of us were thinking about any of the ways in which the profession would be radicalized and modernized over this. Now, let's just go back and start thinking about the firm process. If during the questioning you want to ask me about the fate of the individual mandate and Obamacare, I will be happy to answer it. But now, in effect, what I want to do is to spend more of my time trying to figure out how you structure some of these very things and so forth. And the first thing to understand about the medical system is in many ways it's worse than the legal system. There have been accrued practices that have developed in dominant firms which had this very inefficient partner and associate situation which led to the end run by more modern firms which had different pricing and different management structures leading the older firms to essentially reform themselves so that the profession is largely unrecognizable for not only these reasons but others like multinational firms and stuff like that. And the force that essentially drives the change is summarized in two words, free entry. Now, just to be very clear, let me explain what free entry is in a business. If I'm out there, a free entry business means that all I have to do is to get a certificate of incorporation, which the state will give me as a matter of duty, put up a sign saying, Richard A. Epstein, whatever it is I want to do, medical services, and I can compete for business with all of everybody else. There are no licensing requirements about fitness to do this, as there are, for example, licensing requirements that require you to establish that you're fit to practice the law. And MBAs, for example, are in some sense less valuable degrees than law degrees because they don't give you that quasi-monopoly protection that the organized bar has conferred lavishly on its guys. Now, the AMA um, and the other organizations who deal with medicine, uh, they are great in the cartel restriction. And what they do correctly, perhaps, is to say that you can't practice energy medicine if you're a jerk. And what we have to do is to have a licensing procedures in order to deal with the safety and health of the various individuals who are going to be entrusted into your care. And what I want to do is to assume that there's some degree of truth to that argument, rather than to belittle it. But what happens is one true proposition does not negate a second true proposition which is the moment you can put anything up for safety and health reasons, you could always use this as a barrier against competition by new people. In fact, the entire history of regulation in international markets and so forth is that protectionists always try to go under various kinds of health and safety laws. So if you want to essentially basically make it impossible for your competitor to adopt an alternative form of regulation, you can impose a 10-hour workday limitation on people or 60-hour week and some guy who has people who work 16 hours a day can no longer compete in that market. And it turns out the 16 hour a day guy competes very novelly by having people sleep on the job and working two shifts with one set of workers instead of having evening workers and morning workers. That was the great case of Lochner against New York in which the Supreme Court, rightly in my view, realized that what was put forward as a health and safety regulation in this context was used as a barrier against entry by a different firm using a different form of industrial organization, which would have wiped the floor with the traditional guys by reducing wages without reducing quality. And the health and safety people come in there and say, if you've got all these sleepy people, they're going to make contempt milk. And the answer to that is you can inspect the milk as it leaves the factory. You don't have to change the nature of the inputs to deal with this issue. Medicine is exactly the same kind of profession. And so you have here the terrible risk that the name of self and safety will be put to use so as to prevent competitive forms of practice taking place. How do I know that this is true? Well, let me give you a couple of examples which explain what's going on. One of them is we have rules with respect to licensing. And we also have rules with respect to relicensing. And relicensing takes place because licensing is peculiar to a jurisdiction. It's the state of New York or Illinois or California that does it. Uh, doctors turn out to be mobile. And so the question is relicensing is when you go to California, do you have to be relicensed? I'm going to give you the case of one eminent doctor who used to be here, um, Dr. Casper. Right? Does everybody remember Regina Casper? Oh, yeah. yeah. 
Well, you know, she was one of the world's, le yeah, world's leading experts in uh, basically um, things having to do with anorexia and similar, bulimia and similar diseases. She goes out to California and they say, lady, we're starting from ground zero. Will you please get letters of recommendation from all of your professors in medical school testifying to the performance that you did while you were there? All my professors are dead. Will you please then go back and get the records of their evaluations that are put in the chamber? Well, it turned out that building burned down. This is all true, by the way. Well, then what we have to do is to subject you to other kinds of exhaustive inquiries to see whether or not you're fit to examine to practice medicine where, in fact, they would be honored to have her on the boards which actually examine for any of the specialty. And this went on for a couple of years before finally these guys relented and let somebody come in. So what you know is on the relicensing stuff, the health and safety issue is basically taken care of by the previous licensor and its practice distinguished records and so forth, so that you basically now have a decision where it's almost naked exclusion is being used as opposed to something else. Um, and that's what happens if you don't have a system of natural licensing. So what you need, in effect, is a rule which says whether the states like it or not, if somebody's in good standing and practice in their home state for 10 years and they haven't been convicted of this, that, or the other thing, they could practice anywhere in the United States by showing up. That would completely transform the nature of the medical market. And the way in which one has to avoid this in these situations is you get organizations that come in there and they start hiring the doctors. And the question is whether or not they can hire people who don't have the appropriate credentials. So that gets me to my second example. My view about this is that the state of medicine today is pretty much like the state of law firms has been is that you get wild overstaffing so that the many of the people who are performing various kinds of functions in fact are not needed to do the kinds of things because there are these quote unquote protocols, that's the title of the paper, which essentially get rid of the discretion associated with the operation. So how do you want to handle it? Well, what you have to do is to think seriously about new entry. And the last people who are capable of organizing a new entry on a systematic basis are doctors. Because as I've indicated to you before, your business acumen is negative as zero. And there's nothing wrong with that if you're a good doctor. But if you're trying to organize a firm, you must be able to take advantage of a division of labor and have a firm organized by people who understand the regulatory structures, understand how you put offices together and how to lease space, can start hiring people. And then what they have to do is to figure out is there a way in which you could find a team which will dumb down the requirements that you need without reducing the overall level of performance. And so in the medical type situation, this comes to the question as to whether you're going to take the former socialist, Troy and Brennan, right, who is now trying to run with CBC or something like this. Um, Caremont. Caremont, right. He's trying to figure out how it is that you organize for-profit medicine by breaking down the barriers to entry. It is not an accident that the guy has multiple kinds of training, right, uh, I don't even think he is a doctor, is he? Yeah, he followed Kessler. He followed Kessler, the same idea. MDJD. MDJD, yeah. and you know, you get the right set of skill set, and you go in there, and you try to break this thing down, and to see if you could put together teams. And the first thing that you try to do is to essentially ration the utilization of high-priced specialists under those circumstances where ordinary mortals will, in fact, do the job. And so this then starts to get you to the questions about skill, and protocol and so forth. And I'm going to begin again with a personal anecdote about my distinguished career in medicine, um, which consisted of being a lab assistant when I was 15 years of age and essentially was charged with doing urine analysis, which I probably messed up somewhere around, I don't know, 20 to 30 percent. Um, inattention was a serious problem even at that age. Uh, so you have these things and then where everybody else, what you used to do, you take all these test tubes, right, and you'd fill them with stuff and then you put in the various reagents and you hold them up to the line. Everything was done mechanically and the good techs were fairly high paid. Then somebody came along with something known as a machine and what you did is you took a drop of this stuff, put it in the machine, you got a touch bit up the other side and what you discover is essentially like in law a whole variety of technological advances render irrelevant a set of practices that people actually used to know. To give you but another illustration, it used to be really important if you were a lawyer or a philologist to know every reference to the words de bonis in the Latin text to figure out which were going. Now this thing is all on computer, you put in the words and it all comes up and all that knowledge about how you gather information based upon years of study is rendered obsolete. 
because the searchable protocols, which in fact can do it in any language that you care to put it, because it's just matching characters. I mean, you could reduce something to a commodity, as it were. Well, that's what happens with respect to the tests that take place, more and more. There is this terrible book in some sense, but very good book in another sense, that you know, Malcolm Gladwell wrote, and starting to talk about intuition and protocol and so forth. And what happens is intuition turns out to take second seat to protocol. Uh, one of the mistakes of his book is that he kind of treats them as though they're the same thing, as heuristic shortcuts that get you to where you want to go. But in fact, they work in completely different ways, and the basic rule is the same as it is in everything. In an age of technological unsophistication at the outset, intuition will trump protocol. and an age of sophistication, protocol will trump intuition. So to give you another analogy, you start playing chess, and at the beginning, the best chess players are intuitive. What they do is they know if you control the middle of the board, you get more stakes, you swap a rook for a bishop or whatever it is, uh, you're going to be in fine shape. What happens is that somebody then can start to see nine plies through, nine is half a move. And all of a sudden, intuition doesn't matter anymore, because if there's one variation which tumps the intuition, the machine will turn out to fine. So that in a game in which there's no discretion, right, and no bluffing, so it's not like crossword puzzles, not like bridge and so forth, essentially the protocols start to be beat the intuition. And that's what starts to happen with respect to medicine. And so there were these fellows at Cook County, I don't remember their names, but for years they were trying to figure out how you determine whether or not when you take a patient in who's presenting with various kinds of conditions, do you admit them because they have arrhythmia, heart attack, or something else, tachycardia, you know the words I don't or whether you send them home on the grounds that it's just false presentation. And what they did and eventually is they found that if you asked three questions and did three simple steps, the dumbest intern would outperform the most sophisticated specialist and reduce both kinds of errors simultaneously, right? Um, what we're doing here is having lower cost and lower error. There's absolutely no trade-offs of any sort that have to be made. The protocol dominates. Once you get protocols like that, and I don't care what it's for, and I don't even care about the truth of the example, it's just the, the logic of the argument, the number, of the kinds of people that you need to run the machines change. You don't need a sophisticated doctor to put in three numbers. You can use a nurse's assistant. You can then completely reorganize the nature of the practice to take into account the fact that you can get centralized information. That is work. This is even better than government. Because what happens is something which I think all of you kind of intuit in the way in which you look at your particular practices starts to intervene and to take place as well. That what you now worry about in medicine is the tension between public scientific knowledge on the one hand and trade secrets on the other. Now, why do I say that this is going to create the difference? If you're trying to run this thing as a proprietary operation, so you're not the sainted fellows at Cook County, who are basically doing this in the public domain, and you develop one of these protocols inside your firm, and you spend a million dollars to figure it out, and you are now confident that it reduces both types of error and cost simultaneously. And then what you do is you say, out of the benevolence of your heart, you put it online. What you've done is you've created a public good. And what happens, therefore, is your ability to realize additional revenues from your own reorganization is going to be effectively throttled by virtue of the fact that the competitors can take the information that you generated at your cost and use it in their business so that they will be able to supply the same goods and services that you can supply at lower cost. And if you go back to your good Blackstone on property rights, he always says that those people who sow shall reap. It turns out when you're dealing with ideas and information, you have to worry about exactly the same thing because if you allow other people to reap where you have sown, the reapers will slowly close up and they'll become ciphers on the system as well. And so therefore, what you start thinking about is trying to create these things privately, which places you in enormous tension with the free and full dissemination of information that you'd like to get throughout the medical system. When I put this forward, I don't want to be understood as saying that I think privatization is necessarily a good thing. What I do want to insist upon is that if you're going to have the private creation of information, then privatization becomes an important thing to consider in the way in which you run the system. And these protocols essentially start to give you real advantages. So the question then is, 
should we want to have public funding to create some of these protocols so that it could be widely available? And the answer to that question at some level has to be yes. Uh, we really do want to create a system like this. And so what you'd like the NIH to do is to take the folks at the county hospital and say, here's a million dollars. You develop this protocol on condition that once it's there, it's available for free license by everybody who will comply with certain minimal conditions, whatever those may turn out to be. And you will then get the stuff inside the public domain. So then you said, well, you see now the public solutions dominate the private solution. And that's wrong. Because you never get domination. What you do is you get mixed economies in which both systems go. Because now suppose what happens is some guy sitting in a private company um, sees a problem that nobody else has seen and figures out a protocol that nobody else has done. Is this guy going to turn this information over to the National Institutes of Health so they could put it out, where in effect, if he does that, he loses the advantage? And the answer to that question may well be no. He may decide, I'm going to keep this thing as a private protocol. I'm going to take the risk, as you always do with trade secrets, that the government or some other firm will develop a similar process independently to mine. And the rule on trade secrets is you cannot stop independent invention, even though you can stop copying with respect to the information that you have. And he's going to take that risk and think that it's fine. Or he may go over to some company and say, look, I'm willing to make this thing public. But in order to do so, there's got to be a 5% royalty coming back to me from any and all sales of this particular protocol once it gets put out there. But what happens to the profession of medicine is quite simply this. The more of this stuff that you can reduce to protocol, the less rule there is for you guys with respect to routinized care. And then this has to ask the question, how does this start to map in to the way in which we should think about the practice of medicine? One of the things that's so clear to me as a malpractice lawyer is I'm not with a guy whom you want to see walking into the room the first time there's a problem. You'd rather be able to find some other way to resolve all of these things. And we had, I think about 10 or 15 years ago, Mark, we had this conference on how you manage a business in order to deal with medical error. And, and this is the basic way in which you handle these particular problems. Is malpractice, if you're thinking about this from a management perspective, is that distant cloud over the horizon that you could barely perceive. The single greatest risk of malpractice takes place in routine operations that have to be done every day with respect to thousands upon thousands of people, and somebody through inattention or indifference does it wrong. So uh, you give them pills together that ought to be taken separately, or pills separately that ought to be taken together. And what everybody came up with was the fact that you wanted to reduce the level of discretion that you had in the workplace by getting a series of low-level protocols that could be put together not even by trained nurses but by practical assistants of one sort and to deliver that with a very high degree of regularity. The way in which you deal with malpractice is to cut it off at its source. If you could reduce base rate error um, by an order of magnitude, the number of cases that are going to come through at the other end are going to be reduced by an order of magnitude. And a 2% of revenue hit through medical malpractice will become a 0.2% stuff. Problem not solved. But what happens is, if you think of the substitution of labor, it's the high-priced lawyers who deal with the malpractice cases get cut by 90% in the low-priced talent that starts to deal with the administration of routine products gets increased by 90% so that what happens is uh, the whole system starts to get changed. And everything depends upon your ability to develop these kinds of practices. Now, when you're dealing with protocols of this sort, as in some cases you are with other protocols, what happens is you have centralization of authority and control. But the centralization of authority of control is done inside the firm. It's not done by the national government. And what you must understand is that this plea for, for centralization is firm-specific and competitive markets. And many people start to believe that, no, that's not the way we're going to do it. We're going to centralize it through national government. So let me talk about the Obamacare situation, not from the constitutional issues, but from the question of institutional design as to how it is they want to put together a competitive economy. And the first thing to note is that if you're trying to regulate a competitive economy, regulators essentially always face the following situation. The greater the heterogeneity of the firms that are subject to regulation, 
the more difficult it is to have a system of uniform regulation with respect to them. Because your general U cases are going to have to have parts and subparts, and after a while, uniformity is defeated by heterogeneity. Now, the correct response to this is this is why regulation is a very bad idea. Because the way in which you get innovations by firms is each of them develops their own protocol, their own target population, their own way to constantly dumb down the level of talent that you need as amongst the foot soldiers in order to reserve the discretion there, the pattern I've talked about. And the moment what you do is you, as the, as the health care bill does, it says that anybody who wants to come onto the exchanges, right, in order to provide health care to individuals who've been bounced out of the groups, which is going to happen with alarming frequency, I'm sorry to say, um, we have to be able to regulate them. And the only way we'll be able to regulate them is if we dictate a list of minimum essential services and four different plans that have to be supplied. Um, and in effect, the way in which they have to be supplied so that the only way that you compete is over price and quality of service. Now, nobody in their right mind would say competition over those two dimensions is irrelevant. They're obviously central to any system. But the way in which markets work is essentially everybody who understands the need to dumb down, to rely on protocol in order to create these substitutions, is always going to try to find a novel way in which to do it. And what you'd like to do is to have as many of these different paradigms come up because what will happen is then you'll get survival by natural selection in a good sense. Those people who experiment with lousy protocols will turn out to lose market share. They will reform themselves or perish. And those that get good protocols will do exactly the opposite. And when you start to standardize in this particular fashion, what happens is you are now putting all your eggs in one basket. You're now having a centralized system. So the Obamacare people understand, I think quite rightly, that the model of commoditization which doctors will resist is in fact the wave of the future. But like everything else they do, they're so terrible on matters of technique that they come up with the wrong kind of solution, solutions to do this, killing the very kinds of innovations that they want to create. And even more ominously, creating a situation when you create, in addition to protocol subsidies, which make it very difficult to allocate your resources across firms, what you then have to do is if you give subsidies to individual workers, you have to make sure that they're not going to be captured by the firms because you don't want to <laughs> subsidize them. So by the time you're done with pushing money in at one time and regulating the amount that you could take out at the other time, by, are you all familiar with the term medical loss ratio? Um, it's basically a requirement that you spend a certain fraction of your money on medical care and not on administration. And they come up with numbers that have never been achieved in the history of the provide private provision of medicine, which leads now to another kind of regulatory farce. So what's the lesson that we want to have um, in order to do with this? It's that you want, and I'll take question, you want to get rid of the barriers to entry stuff. You want to see how much you could commoditize. You realize that the moment you commoditize, exactly the opposite phenomenon will happen. There will always be somebody who's going to have to organize the protocols, organize the arrangements, handle the few difficult cases that survive. So you'll get some highly sophisticated people running these operations, doing your difficult operations. But the basic success of the system depends upon keeping the routine operations under place. And you can do that through firms. You could try to do it through government regulation. Generally speaking, the government regulation for the systems that I've said will fail relatively badly because trial and error, which is the nature of this particular game, is something that does not mix very well with regulation. What does it say for doctors? Well, you're going to get protocols in one way or another. Uh, the unearned end rents in the medical profession, this is what's going to happen. Your standard dermatologists, pediatric persons, and so forth, even if they keep their jobs, the wages are going to be driven down. And your elite surgeons, a tiny fraction of people, or your super diagnosticians, and so forth, will do very, very well indeed under the system. But average incomes are surely going to fall. The lawyers, there's a little bit more need for discretion in the system than there is for you. <laughs> so we will have a larger fraction of the elite guys relative to you because the regulatory state is so insane that the guys who will surely benefit if this grotesque system of health care is upheld will be the lawyers and management <laughs> consultants who take you helpless doctors and try to preserve some semblance, some shred of dignity for you against what you will find to be a highly oppressive system um, that will be put into place. This has already happened. And who gets the money? It's the guy who can arrange the waiver from the imposition of the care restrictions. There have been waivers already for 3 million people. I mean, it's big business. 
and being connected, being a lobbyist, being a lawyer, knowing which strings to pull, the money in medical care now is getting waiver from conditions. And on that happy note, I'm happy to take any and all questions you. from any and all of you. On that happy note, the paper is open for questions. In the model that you put forward for both law firms and medical care, yes. um, how does it sustain itself? If you My have model? Yeah so, yeah, so you have the discretionary on top and the commodified on the bottom. How do you grow like the associates or the residents into the discretionary? It seems to me that the, current, the old system, um, part of the reason it was set up that way is you know, for the growth model. It was ineffectual in many ways and there were difficulties. Yeah, okay, well here's the, first of all you need to grow many fewer people. Okay. So that the problem instead of being N is going to be 0.2 N or something like that. And secondly, what you will do, in effect, is you will probably find more systems in which self-financing is going to be required in order to get yourself up that particular ladder. Um, because it's going to be very expensive for firms unless they know that you're going to stay with them for a very long period of time to do the financing, because the free riding problem is going to be acute. We train you for four years, and then off you go. So what you see in business is, is a variety of self-financing, shared financing models which are very good. And let me explain briefly what they are. You want to send somebody back to get the MBA or an advanced degree in any firm, right? What you say is, we'll pay the tuition in the following way. You go out and borrow the money from any bank. And what we will do is when you're here for one year, we will pay off 20% of that loan. You're here for two, we pay off 40. You're here for five, you get it all paid off. So what you do is you never give them the money up front. What you do is you give them a promise that if they remain inside the firm, that then we will get this off. And that is a way in which you could handle the financing problem, right? Because people don't have enough human capital and also handle the defection problem that otherwise takes place. And it took a long time. You know, I, I managed to state this paradigm to you in what, 30 seconds? Do you know how many years it took firms to figure out what they were supposed to do? And then it becomes even more complicated uh, given the kinds of people, promotions, lateral transfers, buyouts, carry. One of the reasons why it's so difficult to run modern businesses today is that the more elite people you have, particularly in law firms, right, not so much doctors, the more likely your income is going to come in what they affectionately call in the trades carry, which is you invent an invention. You don't get cash out at the front end. You get a piece of the participation which comes to you in cash when they cash out themselves by selling the firm, by going public or something else. Um, you start to put together a medical firm and a bunch of researchers, that's the way they're going to start to pay people. Is it a bad deal for you? Well, you know, number 13 at Google was a perfectly ordinary woman and she just happened to get in at the right time at the right place and eight years later she's worth three billion dollars, right? Not a bad deal to have taken a 10% cut in salary at the beginning of the situation. So you're going to have to do that kind of financing and so forth. To give you another analogy, one of the reasons, if you look at baseball, you'll notice that there's a change in the mix of players. The decline in the number of black players, an increase in the number of Hispanics from the Dominican Republic, and an increase in the number of white players, right? Well, there's an industrial organization explanation for that. Um, what happens is in the Dominican Republic, the old system of indentured servitude is alive and well. Very poor company. You can get people in there, sign them to long-term contracts, you'll trade them. You can't do that in America. The minor leagues aren't there. So who do you get? You get guys with college scholarships. Who gets the college scholarship? It turns out essentially these people are internally financed by their parents. And if you have black kids who have low family income who can't do that, they're going to have to start moving away from the sports, which it does. Baseball is extremely acute in this because if you're trying to figure out the ratio between training and talent, in baseball the training matters more than it does in a lot of other sports. Um, because if you don't know how to throw a baseball, all these are unnatural actions. So you're doing everything wrong when you're a gifted athlete and you're finished. You know, somehow or other God taught man how to jump and if you have a 36 inch jump reach, it's amazing. If you're six foot seven, you've got a future ahead of you. Uh, as they say in basketball, you can't coach height, uh, you know, and so forth. So the sports turn out to have slightly different mixes and you start seeing the population start to move. But the, the question of internal self-financing is an extremely important one. And what happens, of course, is you go, you know, you live in New York City or your children do, and all of a sudden, you know, getting into collegiate and Horace Mann and to St. Anne's, you know, at age three, major human capital investments by your parents, right? 
so that by the time you get a kid out in 12th grade where they can get themselves into a major college, if they're lucky, you've already spent a half a million dollars on their education. Um, so it's a complicated, and this is in a way an odd way in which privilege is up there. And then these institutions are aware about that, so they make you pay even more money to get your own kid in, so they give scholarships to try to get them mixed up. Does it work? I think the answer is yes, in a strange way. These institutions have thrived, notwithstanding their own limited kinds of redistribution policies, which again gets you to a very key point. Redistribution is an essential feature of social life. And anybody who thinks that you can run an economy where I'm for me and only for me all the time has never been in any kind of a charity drive, religious organization, medical institution in their life. But the question is, who knows how to do it best? And the answer is never the federal government, never the state. The private institutions turn out to be able to do enough to make the thing work, but not so much just to bring it down. Uh, when you start looking at governments, they always go too far and take an idea. So if you want a little progressive tax, uh, you ask our local president, you know, our former guy here, whatever the tax is, it isn't progressive enough, right? You never say, I think the optimal level is this, and we shouldn't go above it, and we're above it, maybe we ought to go down. In private organizations, you get that level of self-correction, and that's why you want these complicated mechanisms to be kept out of, out of government hands, one of the many reasons. Any other questions? Y yes, sir. Is there any uh, reason that you're sort of advocating both within law and medicine a division uh, between an elite and a proletarian within the profession um, as opposed to um, having those sort of commodified tasks done by persons who are not part of the profession, um, legal assistants or no, you know, nurse I'm, no, practitioners? No, that's the whole nothing. point. No, okay, right. Look, right. the rise of the paralegal is yet right. another manifestation right. in the law firm. Right. And the rise of the tech is what the firm will do, and essentially the core will get larger. Let me give you the university as another illustration. The skill it takes to teach the German language is not the skill that it takes to get a new interpretation of Faust, particularly part two, right? So what do we do? The language programs are now all taught by part-time instructors who are native in their language, whose spouses are somehow or other here, doing a PhD in something or other else, you keep them for three years, you pay them respectable wages, you give them health care coverage, and then sign or you're gone. What you never do for somebody who does a routine task today is to give them tenure inside the university with a lifetime contract. And just as I've talked about deprofessionalization, the same thing has taken place inside university, which the core of the elite, which is the medical faculty or the law school faculty, gets smaller relative to the size of the flotilla. And in fact, in the medical institution, of course, it's really difficult because you're running, in terms of gross volume, 80% clinical and 20% research or something like that. You start, you want to keep the research component primary in the operation. You start creating classes of faculty members, clinical people, non-clinical people, people with distinction, people without distinction. What do you have, fourfold kinds of differentiations, fivefold differentiations here? It's exactly for that reason. In the law school, we do exactly the same thing, but our academic faculty, since we don't charge income, is 80% of the business, and our clinics, which usually run for out money anyhow and have to be supported, are 20% of the business, so it's not as pronounced. But we have the same kind of situation. You have to be prepared to operate more complicated industrial structures to take into account the differential levels of performance, and you have to be prepared to bring in under the tent either by long-term contract, membership, short-term contracting arrangements, people whom you never thought you had to do business with. And this is perfectly universal. And the point I started with at the beginning, you ain't so special, right? We're all doing exactly the same thing. Um, what's special about medicine is you have to know something about medicine. That's why nobody here has said, Richard, we want you to get your latest views on the proper way to perform an incision for an appendicitis. I've yet to be asked that question. I'm happy to answer. <laughs> Bad. Okay. Question? You just went through a lot of interesting and, and uh, significant information regarding these <coughs> systems, including problems with regulation. <coughs> um, and ultimately, that this grotesque system is essentially going to be worse off for doctors, especially at the beginning. What I'm not clear about is whether or not it's going to be worse off for the patients. Boy, is that the right question to ask? Well, let me tell you what I think the answer is. It depends on who gets to do the reorganization of the business. It will be unambiguously worse off if it's done by government providers. What the, the reason why Medicare has worked so well 
is you get private provision by doctors. And this is until recently when the price stuff has become unbearable. Uh, the folks who are getting the care pay zero marginal cost, right? Because what they do is they pay a lump sum per month. They're huge transfers as you get older from people who are younger under Medicare and so forth. What's not to like if you're in a system in which 75% of your costs are being paid for by somebody else? The problem is you cannot generalize that to national health care. You cannot have a system which 100% of the population pays only 25% of its cost. You're not going to get the Chinese to kick in the other 75% for no return, or whatever it is. So at that point, the question really is, can you ration the services in an intelligent fashion? And what we're told is we have 45 or 50 million uninsured people in the United States, and this is treated as a fact of nature. It's not a fact of nature. It's a fact of regulation. Every time you impose a mandate, and the president never voted against the mandate when he was in Illinois and never opposed one of the federal government, you're making people buy something they don't want that costs them more than it's worth. That sooner or later, that tips the balance and they just drop the whole thing rather than taking the thing with the mandate. So what you do is you see the number of insured people through private health plans go from 60 to 50 percent. Now what they're trying to do is to force feed it in another way, right, through these various kinds of arrangements and regulations. Uh, the prediction is that somewhere between 7 and 11 million people in the immediate run and maybe as much as 30 percent of the people who are now on private health care plans will be driven out of the plans because the requirements are so expensive that the employers will drop them. Think of this instead of, like Illinois, every year another dumb mandate, yeah. one super mandate this large, and ask yourself whether or not it's going to change primary behavior. So my prediction is, if you put this into place, is the serious risk of increasing the number of uninsured. And then what happens is these exchanges are so crazily built that they won't be able to absorb them. You cannot run a system coherently where you're trying to give basically a $10,000 subsidy for somebody who puts in $500 to buy something for an exchange where the carriers on the other side are going to be so laden with obligations and have to deal necessarily with the federal government that this market's going to actually open. A standard exchange is exactly the opposite function. What it is is a place for people to come so that if there's an exchange and there are 10 guys who are selling figs on the fig exchange, I can go to this one, this one, this one, this one. Each of them figures out what they want to do and each of the customers. It's that constant set of choices that do it. But if getting into an exchange requires that you meet very onerous requirements unrelated to solvency and reliability, which is what people want out of an exchange, uh, then in effect they're going to start driving people out. So if the New York Stock Exchange started to say, well, we're only going to allow people to sell computers if they agree to the following 18 terms about what they're going to sell us, you know, that exchange is going to shut down. Well, that's exactly the kind of exchange you have in the metaphor. The danger that you have to understand about this stuff is they use all the language of competition and exchange and so forth. But what is essentially, um, how do we say it, a hard government-driven control type system. It is not anything like a market with an exchange. Insurance is upside down. Exchange regulation is upside down. The subsidies, across subsidies, are unsustainable. So my prediction is if you run it this way, it will be worse, unambiguously worse. The way you make it better is to have competitive firms do the innovation and then let people decide. You're going to tell me rightly. Most individuals can't figure out head from tails. And so that's why you get agents. They're called employers, or they're called church groups, or they're called some other thing. So the general rule for dealing with insufficient information, the correct response, is use intermediaries. The current response here is to have mandatory terms by the government, which nobody then understands. Unless you've taken a look at the Federal Register recently, you will have no idea of how this stuff is coming out. And not only do the consumers not understand it, the firms don't understand it, and the regulators at the state level don't understand what it is that the federal government wants. They complain all the time right now that they can't get it. I mean, I've been doing this constitutional jazz lately. The interesting thing about it, I, I, I'm going to claim the following uniqueness. I don't mean to be the liberal or conservative. I'm the only person who's commented on the constitutional issues who's actually tried to figure out how the damn system works from the inside. Everybody else knows about the mandate in some abstract sense. But if you ask them to figure out the operation of the exchanges and so forth, you can't do it. And so I was on the radio this morning with a very liberal commentator from WNYC who sort of welcomed me with the enthusiasm of the bubonic plague. <laughs> and I started to explain how the thing was going to crater. He said, I don't want to talk about policy. I want to talk about the law. 
I said, you can't understand how the law applies to a system unless you understand the system to which the law applies, which he thought was outrageous for somebody <laughs> to say. That total ignorance is the way in which you want to evaluate all of these government programs. We, we do want to hear your views. Why don't, why don't you tell us your views on the constitutionality of, um, of the legislation, but also of the last couple of days of, uh, of, of the argument? Well, let me just see. I've got to turn this phone off first. It's going to be... I don't know who it is, and I don't care, but I'll get it later. <laughs> it's been a huge surprise. I mean, I have to tell you, very two times in my life do I, I find that I'm in excess you know, demand. But this thing has generated more interest, I think, than all the Supreme Court cases put together in the last 20 years. Oh. That includes Cuba. It's just been an extraordinary delusion. Kilo, the oh, case oh. about the, the one guy. That's because Kilo had generated no demand in anticipation of the decision, just a reaction. This one, everybody knew this thing was going to go to the mat. And what happens is the American professoriate amongst constitutional lawyers is split probably 80 to 85 liberal and 15 to 20 percent conservative. And everybody's been out in full force. So there's no question of who's getting the greater amount of volume on this. And it's not only that. When you go to the commentary, not the professoria, they tend to be relatively liberal on balance. But it's not as though guys on my side like me have been particularly shy. So you get huge amounts on one side and very, very large amounts on the other side. And a lot of it is trying to predict the way in which the justices will play the game. And the arguments in favor of Obamacare being constitutional on the individual mandate rest upon both political judgments and constitutional judgment. The political judgment is that five conservative justices will not decide that they want to stand in the way of truth, peace, and project in the American way by upsetting the signal achievement of the Obama administration and injecting the courts right into the middle of political controversies that they have long preached judicial restraint as a kind of an organizing theme, and blowing up Obamacare is the ultimate antithesis of judicial restraint. In addition to that, two of the ablest conservative judges in the United States, Jeff Sutton of the Sixth Circuit and Lawrence Silverman of the D.C. Circuit, have both opined uh, that given existing precedents, there is no way that you could take this individual mandate and isolate it out from the rest of the statute and so therefore, in their view, it's not the question of whether it's an action or not an action. It's always a question of whether there's a choice. You're always making choices, so you're always subject to regulation. That's the position that was taken by Sutton. And Silberman, in his opinion, said national problems require national solutions. Health care is a national crisis, right? You just told me that, so I haven't heard it before, but I know it now. Um, and so therefore, we can do it. So the betting was that if you've got the conservative guys backing off the intervention and the liberal judges and the liberal common days 100 percent lined up in favor of it, that there'd be a crack in a rather fragile five alliance. So the betting was probably 8-1, maybe 7-2, and you kind of line people up. Now what you said is, Tom as well, he's hopeless. His views are closest to mine. He's going <laughs> to strike this thing down, but he's only one guy. Alito might go along. Scalia, he's already said that he's a faint-hearted originalist, which means that he doesn't have the fiber to do this kind of stuff. And then they say, oh, Roberts, he's a chief justice. He's got to be a statesman. Kennedy, he's always a middleman. He'll talk conservative and move to the left. In the end, 7-2-8-1. And Jeff Tubin and I were on Charlie Rose's show with uh, Walter Dellinger. And, and Jeff always is overconfident about his predictions. And he was just doing it and lording it over me. You know, Richard, all your arguments are going to fall on deaf ears. Don't you understand? This is 2012. Next day, he says, what a catastrophe. That was after the first day? After, no, the second the day. The second day, yes. The second day on the mandate, because all of a sudden, five guys come out with machine guns. And they're the conservative guys. Now, they didn't stay that way. Kennedy saw them. But his first question is, are you telling me that the government is in a position to create commerce so that it could regulate it? <laughs> now, that's a hostile question, right? I mean, that's not meant to be friendly. This was after two seconds of introduction. This poor guy was thinking that Kennedy would ask a balanced question. He said, are you nuts to try to do this, young man? Is what he was telling Borelli. I mean, he was thrown for a loop, as I would have been in the same position. 
So I thought it was really completely ungracious of the liberal commentators to say, you know, our case is great, but this guy managed to wreck it. He's a lousy lawyer. I don't think he was a lousy lawyer at all. I think he did his level best job, was reasonably well prepared, managed to get out the central cases. But what happened is the Supreme Court guys weren't biting on the, on the right. And I think, you know, my view is if you get out there and you start saying in public the way in which, you know, we're going to try to domesticate Justice Scalia and the way we're going to try and seduce Justice Roberts and the way we're going to try to flatter Justice Kennedy, it gets people very upset. I don't want to be a lapdog for anybody. And when you then do the political economy, the price of striking down this statute is its popularity is still less than even. And nothing has changed. And my view is the more you know about it, the less you like it. As you start to see them trying to implement it, you see a real amount of disillusion. There's a very low political price to pay. The liberals, of course, they were completely predictable in what they said, and they knew exactly what they wanted to say. Breyer, who's never found anything which the administrative state cannot do in his entire academic career or his judicial career, was leading the particular charge. Kagan, who's very similar, was close behind him, Sotomayor and Ginsburg. I mean, they've never seen a government regulation they don't like. They're like Will Rogers when it comes to this stuff. So they are four solid. Everybody knew that they were solid, and boy, do they sound solid. And you know, poor Ruth was trying to build up our friend, Miss, our friend Verrilli. And it, uh, what I, given what I've said today, it's very instructive to do it against this. She said, and what you're saying, sir, is that health care is unique, right? And what have I been saying? Exactly the opposite, right? is that if you understand the way these systems work, you could find parallels and so forth. I don't think the lawyers for the government did this because Clement and, and, and what's his name, Carbon, are very, they're not my kind of lawyer. I, in the sense, they're Supreme Court lawyers, they like doctrines, they don't want to blow anything up. Um, they are not interested in going back to first principles. They have this peculiar view that the job of an advocate before the Supreme Court is to win cases, which is something which really doesn't enter my mind very much <laughs> in, the, in quite the same way as it does theirs. I'm not a repeat player. So they were trying to tamp it down. And there were several cases where they could have really attacked the justices, but they didn't want to alienate anybody. Carvin made some serious mistakes, making silly distinctions that you didn't need to know. Clement, who's sort of regarded as the dean of this business, um, he, his great achievement was, I don't think in his argument, he really made a kind of a gratuitous error. Um, they, they split the argument. And that's extremely important before the Supreme Court. On the merits of the case... He didn't make a gratuitous... Error. Error. I mean, a lot of... And, and Verrilli made a few of them. He didn't, and, and Carvin certainly made several. Not making mistakes is an extremely important point. On the merits of this thing, let me give you the secret about American constitutional law. Text doesn't matter very much. What matters is attitude. If you were serious about this as a textual matter, the power to regulate commerce amongst the several states would mean that the United States government could provide emergency medical service for anybody who's injured on an interstate train. That's what it would basically cover. And the New Deal stuff expanded it beyond recognition, and everybody's arguing on the assumption that that's the law. So you can't really spend a lot of time on the text, because the text essentially points you where nobody wants to go except me, uh, or very few people. So you then argue this. What then turns is, what kind of mood music do you bring to the issue? <laughs> and what do I mean by mood music? And I'm very serious about this. Constitutional law has different standards of scrutiny. If you think the state is wonderful and it's not going to make many mistakes and do all sorts of good things, you're highly deferential and you call that rational basis. If you think that these guys are going to be just terrible, it's strict scrutiny. So in the history of American law, economic regulation, we assume that the Solons of the New Deal know what they're going to do when they want to cartelize every industry in town. We give them their way. But by God, when it comes to race, we look at you so closely because we know there's a history of discrimination. We're going to stop it. And then it gets crazy when there's no discrimination, as with the Voting Right Acts. All of a sudden, you're starting to scrutinize who can run for a public utility commission in Texas, right? Where there's no issue involved. Well, everybody thought they were going to be wearing their rational basis shoes that day. And it was clear from Kennedy's first question all the way down through that, they were not playing that game. They were playing a game in which higher levels of scrutiny were demanded. And there's nothing you could do from getting them to turn the switch. There were all the rational basis precedents out there that you could rely on, and there are a few strict scrutiny cases you want to. And if the five decide they want to do it, 
They, all they need to do to get rid of all the precedents against them is to say, we have thought deep about this. The idea that you could force somebody into a business relationship in which he has no interest is sufficiently novel that we require a higher level of scrutiny to see whether or not that may be imposed and a mandate. That's all you need to do, one stand. So when Ruth Gins, not when, when Sandra Day O'Connor wanted to uphold the financing bill, all she said is the notable progressive Eli Root said. And you knew that the thing was going to be upheld because he, she had signaled which side of the deference issue it. What people don't know is whether Kennedy will keep to his mind. During the questioning of the lawyers for the private side, he sounded more sympathetic to the bill. This morning, I mean, my, the commentator, the, Brian Lehrer is his name in New York, he read this passage, taped it aloud. Professor Epstein, doesn't that indicate that he's going to change his mind? I said, I don't think so. At which point I was a traitor to his cause, but not to my <laughs> own. Now look, am I biased in this case? No. Am I interested? Yes. I wrote three briefs in the case. I wrote one on the mandate, one on the Medicaid expansion, and one on severance. And they've all taken positions which are somewhat orthogonal to the ones that were taken in the main briefs, being much more pugnacious, which is my habit. Uh, my view about it is that nobody will follow me, but the purpose of writing pugnacious briefs is to make the people who have a chance of winning look moderate, which they are, <laughs> compared to me. I mean, I mean, this is no exaggeration. I mean, I'm willing to do a lot of clock unraveling with saying not. Nah. And what am I trying to get rid of? Cartels, essentially. The progressive movement is a cartel expert. And the reason they need this huge commerce power is to do that. So on that particular note, it's 20 after. I think it's probably time to quit and let you all people go back. And I'm going to do something this afternoon which is useful. I'm going to teach Roman law. Roman law. Good. Absolutely. Thank you all. <laughs>